Everybody is welcome to our second session. Um, I'm sure it's going to be as great as the, uh, the first session. Um, I'm really honored to welcome three wonderful friends uh, and one wonderful people on their own. Um, for the session, it will be uh, around the, the subject of synagogues in the medieval Ashkenaz. Uh, the first one is going to be uh, uh, Dr. Sarit Shalev uh, Aini from the Hebrew University. Uh, the subject is the gates of uh, mercy in the Ashkenaz synagogue, etc. You, you're going to see it. Um, Sarit is a senior lecturer of the Department of Art History, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the author of Jews Among Christians, Hebrew book Illumin uh, Illumination from Lake, uh, Lake Constance, Studies in Medieval and Early Renaissance, Renaissance Art History, 41. Co-author of the Monks Haggadah. A 15th century illumina uh, illuminated pace uh, over Haggadah from the uh, monastery of uh, Tegeron, so I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, and which is in press, and many articles. The most recent, I'm sorry? You deserve to read everything. The most recent between, uh, excuse me, between uh, carnal carnality and uh, spirituality, a cosmological vision of the, uh, of the end of the turn of the fifth uh, Jewish uh, millennium, Speculum 90. Please, submit. As usual. Thank you, Yitzchak, for your nice introduction. And first, I would Start like to make it large. Yes, 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 of course. I'm starting talking while I'm doing it. But, oh, <coughs> oh, it's not the one. Thing. Oh, okay, that's it. And first, I would like to turn to return actually to to Worms. Uh, it's not an easy task after the wonderful uh, lecture of uh, Professor Michael Broke of yesterday uh, evening. So I have to ask for your permission to return to Worms. Is it okay for you? Okay. <laughs> okay. At the beginning of the 11th century, Butcher I, the Bishop of Worms, initiated the building of a new cathedral at the site of the former small Merovingian church. About a century later, possibly due to structural problems, the ambitious building was gradually demolished and finally replaced by a later Romanist church constructed mainly between 1130 and 1181. Like the nearby cathedrals of Speyer and Mainz, the sumptuous result enjoyed the status of a Kaiserdom and offered a local type of Romanesque architecture typical of the Middle Rhine region. Unlike in France, the Rhenish variant did not have the elaborated, often tripartite western entrance. Rather, bold portals were located in the northern or southern walls. The portal played a significant role in designing the sacred space from its profane surrounding and the entrance of ecclesiastical and royal dignities into the church was usually part of a ritual or semi-ritual ceremony emphasizing the transition into the holy domain. The concept of the Rhenish portal was adopted in the second phase of the local synagogue of Worms. The history of this modest small building parallels the two phases of the huge cathedral. The first synagogue, from which only the dedicatory inscription and niche survived, was erected in 1034. Like the first building of the cathedral, this structure was demolished and in 1174-5, within the same building time span as the second phase of the dome, the synagogue was also rebuilt and according to the same Rhenish style of the high Romanesque architecture. The ground plan 
of the synagogue is different, reflecting another type of liturgy, which is beyond the scope of this paper. But the location of the portal in the long wall and its aesthetic design, as well as its wall, as a prominent gate to the sacred realm, were all similar, reflecting a shared local culture. And yet, within the prayer hall of the synagogue, there was another gate-like opening. This was the doors of the Holy Ark, the Aron, which was situated in the niche on the eastern wall and preserved the Torah scrolls. The original Torah shrine of Worms was not preserved, but as later examples of other synagogues show, it was probably designed as an architectonic structure whose style was dictated by contemporary trends. Next to the Aron stood the lectern of the cantor, on which during the feasts and special Shabbats, the Mahzor was placed. The Mahzor, used by the cantor for conduct... Also, thank you. Okay, so we were talking about the machzo that, uh, used, that was used by the canto for conducting the public uh, service in these days. Includes the special prayers and PU team for each event. The Holy Ark, the canto, and the illuminated prayer book were all in close proximity, as you can see here in this example, which is a single leaf. Can you see the, the title? Yeah. Okay, so it is a single leaf of a machzo of the upper wine region of around the 1300. So the, as, you, as you can see here in the illumination, the holy ark, the counter and the illuminated prayer book were all in close proximity and together form a main focal point of the public prayer service. A typical large size prayer book, and here we come. Forward, which exemplifies the centrality of this triangle is the Wurzler Machzor, a manuscript executed by a highly professional scribe who was also a talented calligrapher. The scribe, as you can see here, the scribe followed the white of Worms and mentioned it in some of his notes, though it seems that his book may have been intended for another community in the nearby area. You can see here an example. I'm not sure you can read the Hebrew because it's too small. Now I see it. But you can see the translation no. into it. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. So it is written here that in Worms, the Chazan, it's part of the Kol Nidre, the, the prayer, the opening prayer for uh, uh, the Day of Atonement. And it is written here that in Worms, the Chazan does not continue. Uh, to the, sorry, to the next uh, section until he repeats this passage three times. Okay. As in other machzorim of the time, a monumental gate illustrates the words of the blessing before the Yotzer Piyut of the morning prayer for the Day of Atonement, blessed who opens for us the gates of mercy. The text is written within the open gate, with two doors designed in burnished gold. Despite the fact that the machzor was made in the late 13th century, the one Romanist type of opening is used, reflecting the long life of this style of architecture in, German, uh, in the German area, as can be seen, for example, in the south portal of the Worms Cathedral, built in the second half of the 13th century, as well as that of the women's section in the synagogue, which was uh, added in 1215. We have seen it uh, yesterday. The initial word list is inscribed within the tympanum, also populated with two dragons and vegetal scrolls. Four golden medallions are set on the <coughs> tops and the bases of the columns. They depict the four winged creatures of Ezekiel's vision a herald angel, an eagle, a winged lion, and a winged ox. As already mentioned in the literature, the four beasts are designed in the form of the four symbols of the evangelist, a concept 
which was also based on those of Ezekiel. A fifth medallion at the center of the arch encloses an empty golden throne surrounded by eight stars. Sorry, here you can see it. Uh, the, of course, the similarity to the Christian iconography, not only the design of each uh, medallion, but also the location in the four corners. And of course, here you can see uh, Christ, but in the uh, Jewish iconography, you never see uh, the, um, uh, you never see uh, God is not depicted but you can see it in another way, and now I shall explain how. A fifth medallion at the center of the arch encloses an empty golden throne surrounded by eight stars against a blue sky. The, the throne reminds of the Etomasia, the vision of the empty throne of the second coming of Christ, who would judge the universe an image which was more popular in Byzantine and Italo-Byzantine art, and here you can see a, an example. The Christian visual language may have been used to convey the Jewish idea of the annual judgment by the Lord, the main core of the Day of Atonement, when each person's fate in the coming year is determined. One can imagine the effect of the large illumination facing the counter, at these moments, when the cantor recited the prayer, prayers word aloud, the gates of mercy became verbally and visually present within the prayer hall. This encounter between the cantor and the image of the heavenly gates in the act of opening gives tangible expression to the cantor's role in mediating between the community and the Lord. The concept is metaphorically described by Rabbi Meir ben Isaac, the famous cantor of the Worms community at the time of the first phase of the synagogue. Rabbi Meir was also a well-known composer of Piyutim, some of which have become an integral part of the Ashkenazi rite. In one of his Licha Piyutim, for the Day of Atonement and other fast days, he gives a prominent role to the cantor, and refers to his ability to open the doors of heaven with his prayers. He refers to a verse in Psalms 102, a prayer of the afflicted, when he faints and pulls out his complaint before the Lord. O Lord, hear my prayer, and let my cry come unto thee. The term afflicted, ani, mentioned in the verse, is usually interpreted <coughs> as a reference to the canto, and it is in this meaning that it appears in the piyut, the afflicted, when he faints and pulls out his complaints, knocks at the locking of your doors. In medieval Ashkenaz, the rising of the cantor's prayers to the gates of heaven was not only a literary metaphor reflecting the spiritual level of the cantor, it was also thoroughly related to his actual position next to the Aaron in the prayer hall. The Aaron, the holy ark, containing the Torah scrolls, was empower, empowered with divine holiness. This notion was especially developed in some of the writings of the Pietists. For the Pietist, argues Elliot Wolfson, since the Torah represents the embodiment of the divine glory the divine presence is thought to be present in the place of worship, especially in the holy ark that contains the Torah scrolls. In his commentary on the liturgy, Elazar of Worms explains the actual meaning of this holiness in the context of the Kaddish in which the name of God is sanctified. The cantor goes before the ark should place his life in his hand and pray with all the intentions of his heart and when he says it gadal, he should cast his eyes to the Our Holy Ark, for the Shekhinah rests in it. Such ideas were rooted in previous concepts, which are not necessarily of Pietist origins, such as the one ascribed by Rabbi Elazar, 
to Hiskia, the brother of Rabbi Eliezer ben Natan of Mainz, one of the more influential figures of the 12th century. This concept clarifies that one bows down before the Torah because the Shekhinah itself dwells upon the Torah and is thus located in the Ark that contains the scrolls. The Pietists compared the Holy Ark either to the Ark of the Covenant in the Temple or to the Throne of Glory. As the Divine Presence dwells upon the Throne, so too it rests upon the Torah scroll encloses, enclosed in the Holy Ark. This comparison between the Holy Ark and the Throne of Glory sheds new light on the image of the throne at the top of the gates of mercy in the Wurzlaw Machzor. One can imagine the cantor facing the image of the throne at the top of the gate of mercy in the illuminated Machzor, while standing before the Torah shrine which symbolizes the Torah, the throne of the Lord. The painted image of the throne and the Torah shrine could have merged together in his mind as he concentrated on his spiritual mission to direct his prayers upward. Such, as, such an imaginative fusion between the gates of mercy and the doors of the Holy Ark in the synagogue could have occurred only in the minds of those users and viewers of the book who were aware of the divine presence in the Holy Ark. It was only later, during the 15th century, that the merging between the liturgical and the heavenly realms became present in the image itself. A central example of this fusion is found in a two-volumed Machzor house today in the Bayer Bibliothek in Munich. A color font that you can see here in three pages, at the end of the first volume, indicates that it was copied in Ulm by a scribe named Isaac for Jacob Matitya in the year 1459-60. The patron was the son of Zeligman, one of the most important figures in the Jewish community of Ulm at that time. One of the illuminators of this manuscript followed the tradition and illustrated the prayer blessed who opens for us the gates of mercy. Here, however, the heavenly gate is replaced by an open holy ark. The red cartoon representing the parochet is drawn. Can you see the old image? Okay. The red cartoon representing the parochet is drawn and the two wooden doors are open, exposing three Torah scrolls wrapped in their mantles. Each of them stands on its two staves. Like in the Wurzel of Machzor, the shrine is designed as an architectonic gate with two towers, though the late Gothic style of the pointed curving arch points to its later date. You can see how different it is from the Romanesque round arch, but also from the earlier Gothic arch, the regular one that I suppose all of you know. Here, there is a special affinity to the late Gothic arch of the mid 15th century Torah arc of the synagogue of Nuremberg, on which the words crown of the Torah are inscribed. According to Krautheimer, sometime after after the expulsion of the Jews from the city in 1499, the stone, which in its original location formed the upper part of the ark, was inserted in the wall of, the, of a house in Wunderburgasse 8, together with an inscription and explained its origin. You can see here the, uh, the inscription. The result is unequivocal. The heavenly, heavenly gates of mercy in the Munich <coughs> Ulmachzor are the holy ark within the synagogue. The ark's open doors reveal the divine presence, the Shekhinah, in the form of the Torah scrolls. Such a clear parallel between the heavenly presence and the liturgical domain is further stressed in light of an earlier passage of Sefer Hasidim. 
The one who leads the public prayer should intend in his heart as if the Shekhinah in heaven corresponds to the holy ark. Therefore, the congregation should say, Exalt the Lord our God and bow down to his footstool. For the Torah is his footstool, and the two staves in the, in the Torah scrolls correspond to his legs are like a marble pillars. Which is a verse, of course. Both the Wroclaw and the Munich Machzorim give a visual meaning to the gates of the mercy. Both use the general architectonic language of their time, which is also reflected in the synagogue and its inner space. And yet, the visual language of the two is also different. While the earlier example uses Christian symbols adjusted to the new Jewish context, the later example implies a purely Jewish iconography, moreover. While the earlier Wroclaw uses extra symbolic images to visualize the divine presence, the throne of glory and the four beasts, the Munich example refers directly to the ritual domain in which the service took place. This visual shift between the late 13th and second half of the 15th centuries is paralleled in other examples that take us out of the public ritual domain and into the private sphere. A visualization of the heavenly gates is seen in the illustration to the verse in Psalm 11, 8, 20. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter into it. Can you see the, the lower part of the image? In the bird's head Agada that you have already seen today, uh, which is a one, of around 1300, this verse, which is part of the Hallel recited on the eve of Passover during the Seder ceremony, is accompanied by an illustration of a three-story building identified as the Garden of Eden, Gan Eden. The gates of Gan Eden, in its various sections, are described in detail in medieval Midrashic literature. The identification of the gates of, for the Lord as the entrance to the heavenly garden of Eden also finds a textual parallel in Midrashic sources for this verse, such as Bereshit Rabati. In the future to come, the righteous will be in Gan Eden as it is written, this is the gate for the Lord, the righteous shall enter into it. As in the case of the Wroclaw Machzov around the same time, the Christian visual language plays a central role in designing the Ashkenazi concept. Heaven, as an architectonic construction, appears in Christian representations of the Last Judgment opposite hell. In this representation, the righteous people step in line, one after the other, towards the gate, a tweet similar to the depiction in the Agada illumination, an angel welcomes them. You can see here the angel and the angel of the Hagada and the line of people who are about to enter to the promised land. Moving forward to the late 15th, early 16th century Florsheim Agada, we face again a radical change in the design of the gate of the Lord. The structure of Gan Eden has been replaced here by the open holy ark exposing two Torah scrolls. An inscription in Tanya letter reads, this is the gate. This identification is also rooted in written sources, such as the commentary on Rashi on the same, uh, of Rashi on the same verse. The gates for the Lord, those gates of synagogues that are for the Lord and the righteous shall enter into them. It was, however, only in the 15th century that these ideas were given direct artistic expression in Hebrew illumination when the visual language developed an independent repertoire that was based on the public ritual domain. One may wonder what meaning those images referring to the holy ark in the synagogue could have had when preserved outside the public domain. The designation of the holy ark containing the Torah scroll as the sacred, as, um, um, 
as a sacred nexus sorry, for the ceremonial space awarded it the status of an axis around which the communal identity was built. The use of the vocabulary of the public ritual domain in images found in manuscripts intended for use in the family ritual at home blurred the limits between the public and private domains and stressed the affinity of the family to the larger community of which it was part. The gate regulated the access to the sacredness. A closed gate was a barrier. An open gate was an entrance to the divinity which was restricted to community members in and out the public ritual domain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarit. I, I want to uh, continue the uh, precedence of Effie before and we'll uh, leave the questions for after. Um, I want to invite uh, a very good friend and colleague, Ephraim Shoham Steiner from Ben Gurion University. Uh, he didn't give us a, a long uh, list of uh, credentials, but uh, I'll read what I have. Um, the uh, the title of his uh, of his um, paper is "Lines, Snake, uh, as, as Snakes, a Rabbi and a Panas: A New Look at the Debate About the uh, Artwork in the Medieval Synagogue in Cologne." Uh, if I'm uh, the only one, I can the only book I can uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that I recognize that you wrote is the one on um, uh, how is it called uh, on the margin. The mar margins of minority. Thank you very much, uh, and many, many very important papers. Please, the podium is yours. Sure. Um, if we can just get the lights. Um, thank you, and I'll try and get out of this for just one second. Uh, in the late 12th and early 13th century, in a large halacha compendium named Sefer Avi Ezri, compiled by Rabbi Eliezer ben Joel Alevi of Bonn, we find in the section related to idol worship, Avodah Zarah, a discussion regarding clothes, uh, cloths bearing images that were set on special occasions like a circumcision ceremony in synagogues for the purpose of adorning them. And you can ask uh, Nomi Feuchtwan Gersari or Sarit Shalevini about these cloths. Um, these cloths were embroidered with motifs of birds, fish, horses, and lions, and were sometimes left in a synagogue for a day or two after the ceremony when the synagogue returned, until the synagogue returned from its um, usual liturgical function after having served as both sacred space and communal festive hall during the ceremony. After having quoted both his father's opinion on the matter, as well as his father's contemporary, Rabbi Ephraim of Regensburg, both 12th century sages, uh, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yoel Alevi chose to pen down an earlier source uh, that he had encountered most probably in the family's archived dossier of halachic writings. Uh, it was a letter his great-grandfather, the mother's maternal grandfather, had written almost a century earlier uh, that he found to be instrumental for his discussion. And I, and of the same matter, I, Avi Aizri, that's Eliezer's name, um, the name of his book, found a letter by my elder, my mother's maternal grandfather, Avi M. Imi, our rabbi, Eliakim ben Yosef, and it reads, Concerning the building that was built in the name, in the synagogue at Cologne, on the, western, on the northern wall, on the windows of which they formed tsaru, images of lions and serpents, in which I was greatly astonished to see that they had done this. They changed an ancient custom, uh, which the earlier ones were not accustomed to do in any of the places of their exile. And it is known to our teachers that the custom of the earlier ones has the full statue of Torah, and, it is, and is like a post firmly planted in the ground on which to depend and draw support. Even though their intention was for the heavens to be pleasing to their creator, the second commandment warned them not to do this. As it is written, you shall not make 
for yourself a graven image. This text, I've just quoted, is the opening statement of a letter that will be the subject of my discussion today. Although the great-grandson, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yoel Alevi, Rav Ya, introduces the text as a tshuva, namely a responsum, assuming a quarry was launched and a responsum given, I think it can be defined more accurately as a letter of protest. It is my impression, from reading the text, that no one in the Cologne Jewish community, most definitely among the individuals or the individual that commissioned the decorations, actually reached out seeking the counsel of a rabbi from Mainz. In the next few moments, I will attempt to use this letter as, of protest as a springboard to introduce a discussion about Jewish community, the Jewish community in medieval Cologne, its leadership, and some possible insight into its ideas and beliefs. Over the past few years, I've developed an interest in the life of the Jewish community in medieval Cologne, which in my opinion has not received enough scholarly attention, definitely by comparison to the much more discussed Middle Rhine communities of Speyer, Worms, and Mainz, known as Keilot Schumann. Already, Professor Schatzmiller has uh, alluded to this matter before. In my talk today, I will argue and hopefully convince you that the text in question re refers to events in the 11th century. Uh, and that the decorations protested against that were commissioned by someone or some people in the Jewish community in Cologne were not images in stained glass, as was usually argued, but rather three-dimensional stone reliefs that were more common, a more common decorative feature at that time period, and also slightly more problematic from a halachic point of view, at least to some, explaining one aspect of Rabbi Eliakim's protest. The second point I will try to make, based on both the earlier dating and on the recent archaeological find from Cologne is that the halachic discussion about the synagogue decoration is part of a larger host of issues. Questions of authority, power, claims of leadership, and the nature of leadership in a community that was one of the one uh, that was on the one hand part of a larger Jewish presence in the Rhineland area, but on the other, a community that strove to maintain a unique statement of identity where art and the role of art in the liturgical realm of the synagogue was just one rather important aspect. Um, I uh, owe my enthusiasm to the subject to a series of visits uh, to the new excavations conducted by Dr. Sven Schutte in the Archaeological Zone of Cologne, the site that is now undergoing development that will eventually, hopefully, lead to the museum that will incorporate the findings both of Otto Doppelfeld's excavations from the 1950s as well as the work that was done between 2005 and 2013 by Schutte and his team. Uh, the synagogue in the Rathausplatz, in the center of the Altstadt of Cologne, was the heart of the Jewish neighborhood of the city, the subject of this conference. Um, but let us return to the text. What was about the decorations that raised the heated reaction of Rabbi Eliakim, of uh, Ben Yosef of Mainz? Before we delve into this question and ask, also who commissioned the contested decorations, we should comment on the circumstances. The incident in Cologne, Maase de Colonia, uh, that is how most halachic authorities that discuss the matter and quote it uh, time and again refer to it, uh, is an episode that I believe occurred in the 11th century Cologne in which lion and serpent decorations were placed in the walls of the local synagogue, arousing the ire of the rabbi from Mainz. Both Cologne and Mainz were ecclesiastical towns that had a considerable Jewish population. In Cologne, Jews were more involved in trade, while in Mainz, as the entire Middle Rhine area, there were also, as Michael Toch has masterfully demonstrated recently, a more rural and agricultural interface with the viticulture, vineyard, and wine industry, an aspect extensively discussed by Chaim Soloveitchik. Alfred Haverkamp had argued that Cologne, Mainz, as well as other bishop cities, in Northern Europe were among the cities to reap the benefits of the political and demographic developments as well as the rise of commerce and as an local as well as super regional trade in the 11th century. By the time the incident we will uh, focus on occurred, the Jewish community in medieval Ashkenaz had already a relatively well established and visible presence in both the Lower Rhine area in and around Cologne as well as in the Middle Rhine region in what eventually will become will be known as the Shum communities of Speyer, Worms, and Mainz. And if you want to know anything about the Takanot, here is the specialist, Dr. Reiner Batzen. Uh, it should be pointed out that although in our minds both cities and their representative Jewish communities had strong ties and may be seen as part of what we term Ashkenaz, they are almost 100 miles apart. 
and during the time uh, we're discussing, they belong to two different ecclesiastical and political entities within the Ottonian Reich, the Archbishopric of Cologne and the Archbishopric of Mainz. Cologne had belonged originally to the realm known as Lothringen, an area that had much stronger ties with both nor England, northern France, uh, than, more, uh, than the more German Middle Rhine area. Our knowledge of these communities comes mainly, but not solely, from inner Jewish sources compiled and penned by the male rabbinic members of society who left behind an impressive paper trail in the form of biblical Talmudic exegesis, Jewish court rulings preserved in halachic response literature, and a rather extensive body of liturgical poetry, piyut. We thus have more knowledge of the rabbinic figures from this time period who were more active in the Middle Rhine area of the Shum communities, gravitating around the Torah study centers of Mainz and Worms, and later on Speyer. When it comes to lay members of society, and even lay leadership, we are um, sometimes, uh, and people who are not rabbis, our knowledge is therefore much more limited. We know uh, both these communities had a kahal, uh, but we know very little about the figures in the kahal that were not learned men. Thus, our acquaintance with the early medieval Jewish community of Cologne that, unlike Mainz, did not have a powerful rabbinic presence in the form of a vibrant Torah study center until the 12th century or even slightly later is somewhat insufficient. Um, let us now look at the main player. As far as we can tell, Rabbi Eliakim was born in the, during the last third of the 11th century in and around 1070. He lived until the middle of the 12th century and died probably somewhere between 1150 and 1152. Uh, he became rabbinically active while still young, probably before the 1096 Crusade riots, and his career developed throughout the first half of the 12th century. In light of this dating, as well as my discussion below, I will suggest that the letter cited by Ravya in his book, Avia is quoting his great-grandfather, was written during the last decade of the 11th century, before the First Crusade anti-Jewish riots. This notion is supported by the fact that it is reasonable to assume that these decorations had been commissioned at, uh, uh, before the 1096 violence, when Cologne community as the entire Rhineland community, sorry, I'm sorry, repeating. This notion is supported by the fact that it is reasonable to assume that if these decorations had been commissioned after the violence of 1096, when the Cologne community, as well as the Rhineland communities, were in the process of recovering from the demographic and infrastructural damage caused by the 1096 violent events, and while the synagogue, after having sever been severely damaged, was in the process of renovation and rebuilding, we would have heard at least an echo of this in the letter itself. However, no such mention is made. Rabbi Eliakim's letter is not addressed to any particular recipient. In the opening, Rabbi Eliakim expresses his surprise that the lion and serpent decorations placed in, on the northern wall of the synagogue in Cologne. It is likely that the decorations were added to the northern wall windows, window frames when the already existing synagogue was renovated and slightly expanded towards the end of the 11th century. As both the excavations from the 1950s as well as the recent work done by Schutte uh, suggest, the basic outline of the synagogue was drawn in the early 11th century. This outline survived through most of the Middle Ages and up until the expulsion of the Jews in the 1420s, followed by the appropriation of the building by the City Council of Cologne and it becoming the Rathaus Kapel. The excavations revealed that in the late 11th century, the synagogue was expanded and a chapel was added on the northern wall of the pre-existing structure. It seems that the rapid rise of the Jewish community's size and economic strength and its members' in, uh, involvement in the commerce, trade, and economic rise of the 11th century triggered the community's demographic growth. The archaeological evidence suggests that this addition was made in the late 11th century before the synagogue suffered substantial damage during the 1096 riots. It is in this new expansion that the windows in question were located, and it was on this northern wall that the decorations that raised the ire of the rabbi of Mainz were carved. Rabbi Eliakim probably turned to the community lay leaders, Parnassim, in Cologne, requesting they remove the lion and serpent decorations. In his eyes, the decorations constituted a transgression of the second commandment. Do not make any idol or image. 
Now, although Rabbi Lechim admitted that the commissioner's aim were well intended the, to adorn the synagogue and to make it pleasing to God, the images were unacceptable, both in terms of the particular choice of animals and uh, symbols, the similarity between the serpent and the dragon, and you can ask uh, Ilya Rodov all about that, uh, a focus of idol worship, and the fact that they were three-dimensional. This is not mentioned explicitly in the text, but it is supported by the contextual evidence. Indeed, the close reading of the text that Rabbi Eliakim brings forth as proof supports this claim uh, that the decorations should be removed are all from three-dimensional figures mentioned both in scriptures and in early rabbinic sources. And I'm not going to give you the whole uh, list of uh, uh, references because we are short on time. Now, in order to support my thesis, I have to show you at least some examples of three-dimensional motifs of lions and snakes, or a mixture of both, um, that existed in this time period in the vicinity of Cologne. Um, and I'm going to skip some of my examples and do it very briefly. Um, what you see here is uh, from a church in England. Uh, this is actually a church from York, but the uh, baptismal font that you see before you is from southern England. It was moved to the north. It served originally as the base of a column, and what you see engraved on it are lions and serpents. I know you don't believe me now, but maybe you will believe me when I show you a closer look. Uh, these are the lions kneeling here, and these are the serpents, or winged serpents, flying above. Okay? Um, of course, lions and serpents are present in other uh, context. This is a, a church from uh, southern England, uh, the St. Peter and St. Paul at, at P. Marsh in Sussex, and you see lions on the doorposts. And um, I'm using England not only because um, it has a fabulous uh, website and a, uh, uh, it's a great index to use uh, the Corpus of Romanesque Sculpture in Britain and Ireland, but also because England has very, very strong connections to Cologne, uh, as I, I guess many of you know. Um, these are examples from uh, Germany itself. This is from Saxony, the uh, famous uh, Romanesque sculptures or stone reliefs from the uh, Quedlingburg uh, Abbey in Saxony. And you can see lions here and the mythical serpent uh, over here. Both uh, these uh, um, photographs were taken by Professor Asaf Pinkus of uh, Tel Aviv University. Um, now, lion and serpent decorations uh, are the combination of both are also present in Jewish structures uh, from this time period. And I refer you to uh, the famous Palais Justice, the, uh, uh, the um, basement of the Palais Justice, the famous uh, uh, Maison Sublime in Rouen, uh, where on the bases of columns that were on the south side, uh, we can find both dragons and, or serpents and lions, and you can read all about them in Aus Judaica number one, a fabulous article by Ilya Rodov. Um, so these motifs are extant in the region. I would have wanted very much to find a church in Cologne that has them. Uh, I haven't found so far, but if any of you has an idea, I would be uh, completely uh, flabbergasted if you could give me one uh, piece of evidence and to that effect. But I think it, uh, we can substantiate that this motif of stone reliefs of lions, snakes, or winged serpents is extant in the region. In light of the frequent presence of lions and serpents in stone artwork of the period, we can assume that stone reliefs similar to those found in Rouen, Wedlingburg, and the churches in England were used in the walls close to the window in the synagogue in Cologne as well and Rabbi Eliakim was troubled by the fact that these animal images were raised in relief from the wall and by that, uh, by the particular use of the serpent to him reminiscent of a dragon. Now, Rabbi Eliakim voiced two concerns. First of all, a Jew might actually make the fatal error and worship these images and thereby transgress the prohibition of idol worship. Second, at the minimum, others will think that Jews bowing in the direction are directing their prayers to the images, even if the worshippers themselves had no such intent. In an attempt to drive his point home toward the end of the letter, Rabbi Eliakim cites as a model for emulation the Judean righteous king Hezekiah, who crushed the brazen serpent fashioned by Moses uh, uh, 
and uh, to that he also is alluded by the rabbis as the uh, Mishnayim Psachim 4.9 uh, records. King Hezekiah did six things. Regarding three, the sages agreed with him, and one of those things is he's crushing the brazen serpents because people were wronging in their ideas about uh, worshipping it. Now, it should be noted that in all probability, Rabbi Eliakim's letter of protest was ignored uh, by the Cologne Jews. Actually, a close reading of the text may provide us with the claims made by the individuals that were behind the commissioning of the stone relief ornamentation, since Rabbi Eliakim goes into pains of rejecting them one by one. And uh, by the way, these are uh, closer images of the um, uh, Palais Justice uh, Maison Sublime. Uh, Images, I know they're not really good, but uh, this is the best I could get without being there on the spot. Um, so these are the uh, uh, claims that he uh, man tries to reject one by one. Um, one, their intention was for heavens uh, to be pleasing to their creator. This is what the people are saying in Cologne, and Rabbi Eliakim goes into pains in order to reject that. Um, do we not find Kovim and other images in the temple? And since it is permissible there, it should be permissible also in synagogues. I want to remind you, synagogues are diminished temples. Um, all images of faces are permitted except for the face of a man. And here he's quoting Babylonian Talmud of 42. And the respondent, that is the people in Cologne, should not respond by citing the case of the statue in the synagogue in Nehardea. He's referring to a very famous case of the synagogue Shafi Ativ in the city of Nehalda in Babylon, where we know that the authorities placed a uh, three-dimensional figure at the entrance, and uh, nevertheless, rabbis and other dignitaries continued going to the synagogue saying the fact that it's outside does not mean that we should not enter the synagogue. So these apparently were the claims made by the local colonials. Now we should ask ourselves, who then was behind the decoration that raised the Mainz rabbi's anger? Now, although we have seen that the motif of lions and snake was not uncommon as an ornamental architectural motif in the art of stone reliefs in the Romanesque style of the 11th century, I think that the particular choice of elements was not only emulating types from the surrounding culture, but may have been intentional, reflecting on the person or persons who may have been the interior commission, or the, the interior uh, and the initiator and com commissioners. Uh, of this work of art. This may explain why Rabbi Eliakim contested the ornamentation so vehemently, although he probably knew he would be ignored. Although there is no facial representation of a human in the decorations, the ornamentation had a human, or maybe humans, uh, in mind, a, pers a person or persons that reflected from behind the ornamentation. Um, now, only scant documentary evidence remains concerning the pre-1096 Cologne Jewish community. Nevertheless, some of the community lay leaders are known to us through some texts. One of these uh, is a person who was martyred in June 1096, whose name is found in two of the chronicles that record the 1096 events. Um, that is Mar Yehuda Bar Avraham HaParnas. In the chronicle of Shlomo Bar Shimshon, which contains the most detailed account of the events of 1096 and its surroundings, there is a rare depiction or description of such a communal leader's activity from before the Crusader riots. And this is the text we have here. And there, in Cologne, there was a Parnas, the prime of them all, the most benevolent among the generous, Nadiv Shebanedivin. And he was also the leading man among the speakers, Rosh Lechol Medabrim, Mar Yehuda, notice the uh, uh, title, Mar Nat Rav, Mar Yehuda, son of Rabbi Avraham, a counselor and a wise man, a ver of very high esteem. And when the communities would assemble in Colonia for the market fairs three times a year, he would preside as speaker over them all in the synagogue. They would be silent in his presence, and they would listen attentively to him talk. And when the heads of the other communities would talk and argue with one another, when he would eventually speak out, they sh would silence one another so that he could be heard and they could explain, they could exclaim, indeed, achim, and his words are true. And he was from the tribe of Dan, trustworthy man, and a wonder of his generation. He would go out of his way to help a friend in need. 
He never caused a fellow of, any, of, his, of his any harm, and he was loved by the heavens and adorned by men. It is of him that the psalmist <clears throat> sung the entire song, a psalm of David, Lord, who may sojourn in your tent, who may dwell in your holy mountain. <coughs> in this text, which can also be read as a lament or a eulogy for Mar Yehuda ben Avraham de Parnas, he is portrayed as a charismatic, generous leader, caring for his community, loved by God, and kind to all souls. At least in the eyes of the editor, about Shlomo Berab Shimshon, who either compiled the text himself or copied it from an earlier source, perhaps even a eulogy from 1096 itself, Judah ben Avram's leadership pretensions went beyond his own local community to the regional level. The economic strength of Cologne as a commercial hub with vibrant v regional affairs caused him to aspire to see his community lead the other Jewish communities of the Rhine Valley. As Rabbi Shlomo Rab Shimshon notes, this is the begin in, his be in the beginning of the description of the events of 1096 in Cologne, and I quote, Cologne, the pleasant city where the assembled flock was gathered, and heaven brings merit through the merit to Mauritius individuals. From there emanated life, sustenance, and permanent law, din kavua, to our brothers so widely dispersed. The praise accorded to Judah by the author of the Chronicles or the source, he quotes, leaves the reader with the sense that the synagogue in Cologne was Judah's home field. The, sort, the short text almost leaves the feeling that the synagogue is where Mar, Yud, Mar Yehuda held court. In the description, all those present at the regional assembly in Cologne, locals and guests alike, accept Judah's authority during the thrice yearly gathering that parallel the thrice yearly fairs in Cologne. Judah may, be, may even be portrayed as a representative with powers that match those of the assembly official or cheer person. The praise bestowed on Judah in the text is reminiscent of the acclamatio, the praises and flatteries accorded to kings in Rome. Judah retains the right to speak first. He initiates the procedure, and despite the commotion occurring during the gathering, he supports or enforces silence uh, uh, of the other disputants while he speaks. When he is done speaking, those present affirm his words by exclaiming, he speaks the truth, or his words are upright and correct. The chronicler goes out of his way to impart to him the qualities ascribed to Psalms in Psalm 15 of the upright leader. Texts such as these, of course, should be read with extreme caution and with a grain of salt, especially considering the large gap between the events themselves, 1096, and in this case, um, some events uh, that even predate 1096 and the writing of the text sometime in the middle 12th century. Um, the Nuremberger, Nuremberger Memo Buch indicates that Judah ben Avram de Parnas was indeed uh, killed during the 1096 riots. His martyrdom may have, been, may have caused, in retrospect, his prior communal activity to be viewed as more substantial and more positive than it actually was. I actually, when I read this, I think more of a very powerful leader, somewhat of a bully. Uh, not such a Nadiv Sheba Nadivim. However, alongside his given name Judah and his father's name Avram, the community leader is described as descending from the tribe of Dan. Now, such a description is very rare in medieval northern Europe. However, the ascription of an individual to a specific Israelite tribe in general and to the tribe of John, Dan in particular does appear in Jewish sources from other regions in the medieval period, and you can ask Micha Peri all about it, Eldad the Danite legends that circulated and were also known in Ashkenazi in the 12th century um, can corroborate that. The tribe of Dan is portrayed as a military tribe whose descendants become merchants. In my opinion, this helps explain why the chronicle praising of Rabbi Yudah ben Av of Mar Yudah bar Avraham ascribes his lineage to the tribe of Dan positively. The portrayal of Judah as an important lay leader whose communal activity is related to Cologne and the assemblies that occur uh, and concur with the market fairs in Cologne is likely the result of the wealth he earned as a merchant and a financier. The connection between these descriptions and the tracing of his supposed lineage to the tribe of Dan in literature that draws on the Eldad the Danite letters may explain the use of this description here. Another possible biblical character uh, who may also connect to the Danite lineage 
uh, with the building and renovation of a synagogue is the tabernacle architect, Aholihav ben Achisamach Lemate, Dan, from uh, the tribe of Dan. In my assumption, uh, and if it's correct, and there is a connection between Yudah ben Avram and the Parnas and the renovation of the Cologne synagogue during the last decade of the 11th century, then his involvement in the building project was understood by Yehuda himself, by his supporters, and most probably by Eliakim ben Yosef as an additional reason to trace his lineage to the tribe of Dan. Um, furthermore, I wish to suggest that the choice of images carved in stone in the stone reliefs in the northern wall and surrounding the windows of the new wing of the Cologne synagogue, whose building was apparently completed shortly before the crusade riots, was deliberate. A commissioner tried that way to present himself either by alluding to a biblical verse or to alluding to his name through the images he chose. I want to remind you, the tribe of Dan is mirrored in uh, the Bible both by a lion and by a serpent, a snake. Uh, so these two motifs appear in the name of Judah as Judah and by his lineage to the tribe of Dan. Um, I wish to suggest that the following... <coughs> that following a rising pattern among the local Christian population, a Jew or Jews from the commercial elite of Cologne supported or commissioned the new addition to the Cologne synagogue, a site he or they saw as their court, and therefore adorned it with specific motifs that were chosen to allude to the particular individuals who commissioned them, and that this may be also the reason or the background for Rebel Yakim's critique. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And our last uh, speaker in our session is our uh, very good friend and colleague, <coughs> excuse me, Nomi Sarig, um, uh, Dr. Sarig um, serves as a project coordinator of the Jewish Art and Visual Culture Research Project in the University Goldstein Gor uh, Goren Diaspora Research Center here. She received her PhD from the Hebrew University in the year 2000, writing on Torah binders from Denmark, submitted to Professor Betzal and Narkis, and date Professor Narkis in 2005 and 2006. She was a postdoctorate fellow at the Center of Advanced Jewish Studies, University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, in the year 2009 and 10, a fellow at the Fran uh, Frankel Institute of, uh, for Advanced Studies, uh, Judaic Studies, University of Michigan, and Arbor. She has taught at the universe, universities uh, in Denmark, Sweden, Germany, and Russia, and lectured extensively both in Europe and in the United States. Dr. Feuerfunke Sarig has published on various uh, aspects of Jewish art and visual, visual culture, including an extensive study of the Torah binders of the Danish Jewish community in Copenhagen, and um, a catalog of the Ju Judaica collection of the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt. 2006. She's an author of uh, the upcoming book, we are all waiting for it, The Father, um, Father's Instruction, Reading the Nuremberg uh, Miscellany as Jewish Cultural History, scheduled to appear by the Goethe in 2015 this year, and in current, uh, is current working, we are all waiting for it, and the uh, invention of the textual and visual printed tradition the Minhagim Buch by uh, Shimon Halevi Gunsburg. In addition, she's um, studying uh, Ibrais writing on Jewish rites and rituals, please. Thank you for your too generous introduction. I'm going to take you somewhere else to an entirely different period. I hope you enjoy it. For a number year of years in the early 18th century, the house on Domstrasse 14 in Greifswald had a full-sized synagogue. 
It was equipped with a Torah scroll and all of its implements, the requisite furnishings, and prayer books. Surprisingly, all that it was missing was Jews to worship it in it. In fact, this is the only synagogue in history that was neither intended for Jewish worship nor was meant to even be visited by any Jew at all. At the time of its construction, not a single Jew is known to have lived in Greifswald, located on the northeastern tip of Germany. Rather, the synagogue served an educational objective with strong museological characteristics. Indeed, it was subsequently regarded as an exhibit in its own right, a museum judaicum, probably the first of its kind. After the death of its original owner in 1712, the synagogue and the Judaica collection were removed from their original location in Greifswald to Leipzig. They were, they were eventually moved to Dresden to be exhibited in the Wallpavillon of the Zwinger Gallery of the Dresden Court as part of the Judenkabinett. From 1864 onwards, traces of the synagogue are lost. Although visually vanished, the Meierische Synagoga, as it is called, not synagogue, but synagoga, nevertheless remains an everlasting relic in a contemporary verbal description. In this paper, we shall weave the, we the missing third dimension into the text and revive the bygone synagogue without Jews. Jewish settlement in the Hanseatic city of Greifswald, we have here an expert on the uh, Hanseatic uh, culture and society and history, so please forgive me if I make any mistakes, dates back to the 2050s when two families of merchants settled there. A stable community is first recorded in the early 14th century when the local dukes granted the city's inhabitants, including the Jews, residence privileges. Jews dwelt in Greifswald until the Thirty Years' War, but when the Swedes took over the city in 1648, alarm bells tolled for the local Jewish community until ultimately they were deported from the entire land. Against this backdrop, Johann Friedrich Meyer, a Lutheran pastor in the Dom St. Nikolai and theology professor at the local university, commissioned in 1706 the construction of a synagogue in the library of his home. Faithful to his proactive implementation of Judenkatechismus, he set out to offer his students and colleagues first-hand acquaintance with a Jewish house of prayer. The project was entrusted to Maya's student and future colleague, Christoph Wallich. The mission was accomplished in 1708. Wallich was, a born, was born to a Jewish family from Worms. In his adulthood, he served as cantor in Frankfurt am Main and attests to have been mastered also the art of a scribe of virtual texts, Sofer. Later on in his life, however, he embraced Christianity, subsequently earned a title in theology from the University of Rostock. Wallich composed a detailed booklet that describes the Meirische Synagoge in Greifswald. It was published in three editions, in Greifswald in 17, 1708, in Helmstedt in 1712, and in 1715 in Braunschweig. His meticulous description is the only relic of the former synagogue and exhibit. Its importance lies in its contribution to our knowledge about early 18th century synagogues in Northeast Germany, from which hardly any remains have survived. We will therefore revive Wallich's verbal rendering by comparing it to information ex extrapolated from descriptions by other humanists and Hebraists rabbinic writings, as well as images of contemporary edifices, furnitures, furniture and furnishings. A priori, there can be little doubt that the Meirische Synagoga is at least a near authentic rendition of a contemporary synagogue on two grounds. Its realizer's Jewish background on the one hand, and the educational purpose of the projector's project's patron, Johann Friedrich Meyer, on the other hand. As stated already in the title page of the first edition were the words zum Nutzen der Studierenden Jugend aufgerichtet. Reading almost like an entry to an exhibition catalog, Wallich's description begins with an introduction of the object and proceeds to place it in its ritual and ceremonial setting. With no opening phrases or further ado, he accompanies the visitor into the interior, as it were. 
At the entrance to the synagogue, he says, is a basin for the congregants ritual hand washing. Accordingly, the inscription over the basin reads, El Chatz Benikion Kapai, I will wash my hands in innocence. He then explains the symbolic significance of corporeal pur purification, dedicating an entire passage to this issue. Proceeding to manner, matters of cleanliness and respect for the synagogue, Valich mentions the existence of an iron bar by the door that serves for discarding the dirt before entering the prayer hall. He further states that such devices were used in the synagogues of Fürth, Worms, and Frankfurt, the latter two being synagogues that he personally knew. In this, he describes an old custom which was hardly documented by Christian authors on Jewish rites, but referred to already by Johannes Pfefferkorn in his book Ich heiße ein Buchlein der Judenpeicht, published in Cologne in 1508, who says, es haben, es haben auch die Juden vor der Synagoge eine eingemauertes Eisen, daran müssen sie die Schuhe räumen und säubern, er und sie in die Synagoge gehen. Later in 1714, the Protestant theologian and Orientalist Johann Jakob Schutt, who is considered to be the first ethnographer of Jewish rites, reports a similar iron bar at the entrance to the synagogue in Frankfurt. I search for synagogues that have it. Sorry. As a mundane object of no great import, the shoe scraper is not frequently mentioned in rabbinical texts despite its bearing on matters related to the observance of Shabbat. It is told, for example, that Maharil did not abstain from using the iron bar on the holy day as he was accustomed to do on weekdays. Evidence of the existence of such a device in most places, quote-unquote, made either of iron or of wood is found in a response by Maharam Mintz, who served as the rabbi in Mainz, Landau, Bamberg, and Posen in the 15th century. The custom is once again referred to in the 17th century by Rabbi David Levi Segal, author of the Touré Zahav, who officiated mainly in Poland and Moravia. Walich is therefore relating to an apparatus that, though commonly used, drew little attention in writing, apart from debates concerning the proper manner of observing the Shabbat, while maintaining a measure of aesthetics within the synagogue, and I'm indebted to my friend Yitzhak Lifshitz for finding or helping me find those sources. Above the main entrance, Valich continues, is the abbreviated inscription from Psalm 11820, Zer Sha'al Adonai This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter into it. This passage was favored in Ashkenaz for synagogue portals as a reminder for the worshippers that they are about to enter a holy site. Maya's synagogue was decorated with numerous inscriptions taken from the Bible, Mishnah, and Talmud, as well as moralistic texts and folk dictums. Some of them were a traditional part and parcel of synagogue decoration. One such example is the ornamentation above the Torah Ark, which comprises of three gilt crowns, surmounted by a quotation from the Mishnah Avot 413, Keter Torah, Keter Kuna, Keter Malchut, namely the crown of the Torah, the crown of the priesthood, and the crown of kingship. This motif can also be found in the Baroque Torah Ark in the synagogue of Worms, where above the Torah crown, the, the Torah crowns is another prominent one that symbolizes the crown of good name, Keter Shem Tov, mentioned in the Mishnahic text as well. I hope you can see it. I guess so with the relevant inscriptions. The Ark in the Old Ka Synagogue of Krakow shows an abbreviated form of this motif, which includes only the crown of the Torah. Similarly, the Ark in the Ramos Synagogue in the Kazimierz near Krakow of around 1558 presents a crown painted in gold. Several other texts quoted by Valich are known from other earlier Ashkenazi synagogue. synagogues. Some, for example, appear in the late 13th century Alt Neuschul in Prague. Above the left rose window, in the eastern wall, the abbreviated inscription Dalif Nemiat Taomed, know before whom you are standing, is featured. This midrashic dictate is a reminder for the cantor and the congregation to humbly direct their prayers to the Almighty. In Greifswald, reports Valich, it is inscribed in the lower part of the Torah Ark. Ganz unten am heiligen Kasten. Valich further reports that in the Mayrische Synagoga, 
The inscription, Shiviti Hashem Lenegdi Tamid, I've set the Lord always before me, from Psalm 16, 8, is placed below the previous one. Counterbalancing the aforementioned writing in the Alt Neuschul is the abbreviated abbreviation Shilat, placed in, to the right of the Ark, in accordance with the continuation of the verse, Surely he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. An examination of the sources of most of the other texts that are adorned the Meirish Synagoga shows that they were founded on Jewish folk literature and popular dictates. Contemporary synagogues in the German cultural realm only rarely showed inscriptions similar to those described and interpreted by Wallich. A search for comparative examples leads us to the synagogues in Eastern Europe, which were replete with rich walled paintings and plentifully interspersed with inscriptions. Among other texts, Wallich mentions three abbreviations that appeared in the Greifswald synagogue walls. Samot, namely Sumerava Setov, Damesek, Da Mishuru o Damask, Mishuru Koncha, Atles, Az Tov Yelecha Sela. These three inscriptions were uncommon in Jewish synagogues, but do so in the East, as is exemplified by the now reconstructed synagogue of Grozic, built around 1640 and painted after 15, 1652. In fact, German synagogues around the turn of the 18th century were austere, in keeping with the current style of architectural design. Yet a small group of rural prayer hall houses in the southern region of Franconia and Swabia present a stri striking similarity to the main features of the painted synagogues of Eastern Europe. This resemblance is manifested in the concept, composition, technique, style, motifs, and above all, the particular penchant for inscriptions incorporated in the decorative scheme. The South German rural synagogues were painted by wandering artist Eliezer Zussmann, who recorded his name and a few biographic details in some of his works. What transpires from these brief insertions is that Zussmann, the son of the cantor Shlomo Katz, came from Brod, as he calls it, thereby most probably using the Yiddish colloquial form for Brody in Galicia. His documented activity spans just eight years, between 1732 and 1740, although he may have been active earlier and perhaps even later than these dates. During this period, he painted the synagogue, the wooden synagogues of Bechhofen Rimpa, Georgensgemünd, Horbermain, I'm sorry, Unter Limburg, and the Frauen Synagoge of Steinbach, Kirchheim, and probably also the synagogue in Kornberg. Yet there are assertions that his paintbrush embellished also other prayer houses in the region, such as the one from Oldenbach, claimed to have been painted as late as in 1752. Almost none of these synagogues survived demolition in the hands of the Nazis. To demonstrate the common tradition of the Meirische Synagoga and that and the one that Eliezer Zussmann and his fellow artisans imported from Galicia, let us return to Wallich's listing of the inscriptions on the walls of the synagogue in Greifswald. Briefly, and with no explication, Wallich refers to a custom of inscribing a text in black upon white, which is commemorative of the destruction of the temple. Albeit, in abbreviated form, such an inscription is found in Zussmann's synagogue in Bechhofen, and similarly appears in, to the right of the Torah Ark in Unterlimburg. To give one more example, a rhyme text from the walls of the synagogue of Greifswald focuses on the vanity of earthly life and the transient nature of all material goods. It claims that wealth is worthless as only righteousness delivers from death. Immediately thereafter, Wallich quotes yet another maxim that indicates that money comes and goes, whereas a day that passes in one's life is irrevocable. This inscription is also part of Zussmann's visual vocabulary. The artist from Brody employed it in the synagogue of Unterlimburg, dedicating a large panel to this moralistic inscription to the left of the entrance to the main synagogue hall. What then were the sources of inspiration that guided the convert Christoph Wallich in his decoration of the Meirische Synagoga in Greifswald? Our initial assumption was that he more or less replicated his 
in his patron's home, a synagogue similar to what he had known from his earlier days and as an observant Jew in Worms and in Frankfurt. This educated guest notwithstanding, there can be no doubt that he was also highly influenced by artistic folk trends from entirely different sources. Wallich was apparently fascinated by the vivid polychrome of the painted synagogues of Eastern Europe in general and of neighboring Poland in particular. If you notice, oops, okay, sorry. I can't even find it over here, but it's, it's really on the tip adjacent to Poland. These enchant, it is here, sorry. It's right over here, and this is the Odonaise, so Poland is right over here. These enchanting interiors gave him the opportunity to elaborate on moralistic and folk aphorisms for the scholastic benefit of Christian visitors. The synagogues painted by the Galician Eliezer Zussmann with their rich iconography, so similar to what Walich painted in words only two decades later, all point to the same tradition of synagogue art in the East. The synagogue of Greifswald was therefore more a simulation of a prayer hall in its own region and less so one that evoked Wallich's memories from Worms and from Frankfurt. For lack of verbal or visual relics that may enlighten us as to contemporary synagogue interiors in, in Germany's northeastern tip, we are limited to the full re in the full reconstruction of the Mayerische Synagoge. What we may nevertheless conclude is that, he, that it is deeply rooted in the local scene and may perhaps have thus stretched the map a bit into the Polish periphery. May we then consider the Mayerische Synagoge in Reichswald as an authentic replication of a contemporary local synagogue? Three main elements in Wallich's description are strikingly missing. Only a few years later, the aforementioned Johann Jakob Schutt published his voluminous work, Jüdische Merkwürdigkeiten, in 1714, with a supplementary volume printed in 1717. In a general statement, Schutt claims that, I'm quoting, it is noteworthy that all the Jews build their synagogues so that one descends a few stairs in order to enter them. Although the Greifswald synagogue was built in an entirely, I'm almost done, an entirely existing space, namely the Mayas Library, this architectural feature could easily have been achieved by merely lowering the synagogue floor. At the very least, if such measures were not taken, one would expect the erudite Wallich to mention this physical lacuna in writing. Secondly, there is surprisingly not a word to be found in Wallich's description about seating arrangements within the prayer hall. More importantly though, is the fact that women are not ex non-existent in his description of the synagogue and there is no reference to the space that was allotted to them in the interior. It, it therefore transpires that the Mayerische Synagoge in Greifswald, built under the baton of Christoph Wallich, conglomerated elements from synagogues from wi with which he was familiar. What was apparently of interest to him was not so much the architecture or ground plan, but rather what can be extracted from the synagogue furnishings and decorations in order to instruct the local theology students. His mission was not to create a synagogue as such, but to offer an educational tool. He consequently took the liberty of deviating from a realistic rendition of a local synagogue, um, what a, a local synagogue would have looked like in his own or in his own words, the creator of the Mayerische Synagogue admits that he does not replicate any active synagogue within the radius of 50 miles. The one he designed, he says, is full of light and orderly, traits that are rarely found among Jews. Wallich's patron, Professor Johann Friedrich Meyer, was in many ways not only a missionary but also an innovator. Aiming to introduce his students to Judaism and Jewish practices, he provided for them a three-dimensional museological display, a Synagoga Christiana created for Christians. Unfortunately, the Mayerische Synagoga is no longer physically extant. It is only thanks to Christoph Wallich's masterly painting with words that we can reconstruct it into a vivid image. Thank you very much.
We only have uh, less than 10 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, please, um, Sarita and Effie. <coughs> yes. Any question? Please. Um, a short question to Effie. Um, what is the function of this addition that you of, of the synagogue? What, what, you, what, you, what you call the chapel? And why do you think? And why? And why do you think these uh, pictures of this line in, in this part of the synagogue? Um, what we know from later from a later period, um, um, more specifically from the 13th century, is this is that this is eventually functions as the farm tree, um, the, the women's section of, this, of the synagogue, but. Um, uh, I think very um, reminiscent of what we have from other synagogues in Europe, and um, what I'm thinking of especially is the Altnoschul in Prague. Uh, when synagogues of this nature were expanded, walls were not, not knocked down, but additions were added, and sometimes on a piecemeal kind of uh, addition. In other words, um, you would have the, rectangle, the rectangular shape, and, li and little by little, smaller chapels were added alongside the walls, eventually either functioning as Faumschul or if the community really um, uh, uh, morphed in size, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the walls were knocked down. Um, uh, another example I have in mind is Speyer, I think, that has a similar kind of uh, uh, um, architecture. So, um, but I think that for the 11th century, which is, in my humble opinion, uh, the, the dating of this uh, extension, I think that this may have served maybe as a kind of addition to the synagogue that f for prayer functioned as additional space for prayer, but when the synagogue was used for other purposes, uh, like the communal gathering that is described in the, uh, in the uh, chronicles, it may have been the site, I, I wouldn't want to say where, um, where uh, where Yehuda ben Avram is is uh, situated or enthroned, but it's um, it's it's part of the assembly hall. Micha, please. A question for uh, Sarit. I love your uh, presentation, especially the way you look at the manuscript through the eye of the user, you the Chazan, how what he sees in the book. And I was wondering whether you have another example where um, imagery serves as sort of a contemplative um, tool or mystical. We know that from Christian manuscripts that people mm -hmm. use it as a guide for, uh, for uh, contemplative uh, rites. Two examples? Okay, yes, there are other examples. You know, it's very difficult to answer this question without showing images. <laughs> Just to, just, just to describe them, but I think that and this is, you know, a new direction that I'm trying to go through, uh, to look at the Mahzorim in their site, in the synagogue. And when you look at them, you know, in this way, many of them are actually, you know, a kind of reflection of what what's going on in the prayer hall and a kind of inspiration, you know, for, especially for the cantor, who, is a, a, who has a, a very prominent role in mm -hmm. conducting, conducting the prayer. And I think that the, especially you see it when you look, you know, what I call the, the triangle, because the proximity of them and, you know, on their own and chazan and and it's something, and I think that, you know, th this tri triangle, uh, which combining all the, you know, the, the holiest place in the, in the synagogue with the canto and the book has got the potential to, to affect uh, the chazan and maybe other uh, people in the synagogue. And I, th I think that this is a very important question if other people could have seen it uh, as well. It is a question, but it was very big, and I'm sure that people were very curious in looking at them. So maybe even if they didn't see it, you know, in a regular uh, basis, they they did, in a way, 
But and I think that you know the the the, the adventure of praying with such big prayer groups uh, has got a potential. But on the other hand, and I have to add it, not all of the images had uh, this uh, the, the, this effect. And I think that this returns to to your question about uh, the memorial devices that we have seen in in Sarah's uh, uh, nice presentation uh, in the morning. Uh, some of the of the images in the Machzorim could have distracted mm -hmm. the the Chazan if we if we see it from this uh, this angle. So the, there are other aspects as well. This is only one aspect, but it is a very interesting aspect, and I think it can it can be detected in many images of the Machzo, but certainly not all of them. So the the complexity of the illuminated manuscript is something which is very interesting. Then we don't have to look at it, you know, as a general phenomenon, but as something combining different uh, aspects. Um, please, Professor Schatzmiller. <coughs> it's for a fry it's just information. Uh, when, uh, it, it, as it happens, the New York Times say that they discovered in uh, Cologne a synagogue of the Carolingian period. Mm. So, of course, I went to see it. And no, of course, it's not. My question to you, uh, uh, they didn't show me anything. No. Uh, uh, my question to you, I have two. First of all, is the city hall the old synagogue or this synagogue? I mean, you know, the no, the contour is there. No. The con no, it's not. No, no, no. The Secondly, did they in the meantime, uh, you know, the synagogue was uh, covered, they didn't show it to anybody, right. they didn't show it to you. Yes, 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 the, 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 um, during the excavations uh, in Cologne uh, through between 2005 and uh, 2013, uh, I visited uh, the, the tent that was the, the epicenter of the, yeah, of the excavations a few times. Um, I know what you're referring to. In other words, that one, of, one of the claims that was made against Sven Schütte was that he was trying very hard to uh, pitch for a continuity theory. In other words, he was, he was under the impression that the Cologne synagogue was not only a Carolingian synagogue, but actually dates back to Roman times, and he thought he could find more than one strata of a synagogue dating back all the way to the fourth century. Um, I think he couldn't facilitate that, and I think that he, his theory about the continuity of the Jewish community in Cologne is probably cannot be facilitated. Nevertheless, um, we have positive data, uh, both archaeological and documentary, of the existence of this synagogue, in other words, the contour of uh, the synagogue that was found in the excavations from the early 11th century early 11th century, 1021. Um, it, 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 this is what, what, what Aronius refers to in his, uh, in his sources, and I think that can be facilitated pretty, uh, um, pretty nicely. Uh, and the archaeological evidence, uh, um, both dug up by Doppelfeld in the 50s, as well as the stuff that um, Schütte did over the past seven years, um, demonstrates pretty straightforwardly that the 11th century structure was expanded in the 11th century, then it was severely damaged, and then it was redone at the beginning of the 12th century, right after the Rhines. So what I'm referring to is the addition of the late 11th century that was hit hard during the 1096 riots and rebuilt later on. Um, I'm sorry, but we'll have to uh, finish this session. We're already late.